O God, who didst make thy holy confessor and doctor, John, a man of perfect self-denial and an eminent lover of the cross. Words taken from today's collect for St. John of the Cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of the greatest mystical doctors of the church is today's saint, John of the Cross, alongside St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystics. He is one of the premier teachers among the church's saints and doctors on how to detach, to let go of things of this world and live for God alone. Thus, he is sort of the doctor of detachment. Let us then spend our time reflecting on a few moments of his own life, as well as some of his teachings in relation to this most fundamental aspect, this most essential aspect of the spiritual life. Once St. John wrote, quote, In detachment, the spirit finds quiet and repose for coveting nothing. Nothing wearies it by elation, and nothing oppresses it by dejection, because it stands in the center of its own humility, end quote. Again, nothing wearies the detached person by elation and nothing oppresses it by dejection. Nothing wearies it by elation and nothing oppresses it by dejection. In other words, detachment enables us to be unflappable. People who are attached, they flap when that attachment is touched. When something is going wrong with their attachments, They start to flap. Such an unflappable life is based on a love that can conquer anything of this world. And that love, it is of God. God's love. Thus, he says elsewhere, Live in the world as if only God and your soul were in it. Then your heart will never be made captive by any earthly thing. From his sayings, we find this one. In joys and pleasures, immediately draw near to God in fear and truth. And you will neither be deceived nor involved in any vanity. Again, in joys and pleasures, immediately draw near to God in fear and truth. And you will discover detachment. He gives us many examples of how to live this sort of detachment in his own life. Throughout his writings, we rarely find the word I, me, being used. He was known to be a quiet man, but especially slow to speak of himself or of his experiences with God. He didn't talk about himself. He didn't promote himself. He didn't put himself on stage. Still, the works he wrote are all about his experiences with God. They're very personal, but they are detached. Here we can see a sort of echo of St. Thomas Aquinas. Neither of them were interested in promoting themselves, but only the truth. And that requires detachment. Oh, that we had more of that today. We have so many cults of personality today. From one of his close contemporaries, we hear this report. Quote, his face and appearance conveyed joy and peace. I never saw him moody. I never saw him moody or frowning at himself or at his subjects. His behavior was always gentle, end quote. We should add here that by many accounts, his childhood was one of much trial and instability brought on by the premature death of his father, the poverty of the family because his father was considered to have married low, and so he did not receive the support from the extended family that they deserved. 
So their social position was in question. And they had to move on occasion to find more work. In his youth, he worked in a hospital for dying profligates. Dying profligates. They had bad, wicked diseases. Yet here is a man who overcame any inadequacy or baleful influence of his childhood. And that is only possible with detachment. He never said, I'm a victim. Poor me. Look how I grew up. Look how I was treated. He was detached. As a young priest, he met St. Teresa of Jesus, who even across the distance of centuries is still very attractive, still very charming. St. Alphonsus Liguri, almost two centuries later, fell in love with her, calling her his second mother after the Virgin Mary. And his own dear mother was still alive. I guess she came in third. St. Teresa naturally inspired trust and a certain devotion. Once she said to her brother, they have such blind confidence in me, I don't know how they can do such things. But when she met St. John of the Cross, although she loved him deeply and felt lonely without him around, she found in him someone who could stand his ground despite her charming and infectious personality. And there was quite a disparity between them. She was 52 and he was in his late 20s when they first met. When she was first initiating him into her ideal of the Carmelite restoration, Carmelite religious life, they disagreed on various points and sometimes she admits I got annoyed at him. Also, we should recall how she had to use much of her persuasion to keep him from going off to the Carthusians. She's the one who kept him in Carmel. These are all signs of his detachment. Yet it was St. John, amazing, it was St. John of the Cross who enabled the great St. Teresa to finally enter in to the mystical marriage. For one day, one Palm Sunday, he brought her communion at the grates. And she was used to receiving a large piece of the host and he gave her a small piece and she was disappointed. She was attached even to that. The Eucharist, something so beautiful and good. But she wanted the big piece. And on her way back to her stall in the choir, our Lord helped her detach and she realized that she was wrong in her way of thinking. And he came to her and he wed her with a nail from his hand. And he nailed her to the cross with him. And she entered in from that moment into the mystical marriage. We can also recall the incident of a beautiful woman of Avila. She fell in love with St. John. Since he was so unflappable, so unmovable, not showing any signs of affection in her direction, she decided to leap over the wall and wait for him in his cell. When he found her, according to one recounting, instead of running away like St. Joseph, the patriarch did of old, or as many of the other saints prudently did, the story is, is that he helped her see the fruitlessness of her desires. He helped her detach from this evil thought, this evil path she had taken. Then she left on her own, shamed and cured of her desires. She went back the way she came. I think the saint was in his early 30s at this time. Once again, this shows a deep detachment. This was a great trial. St. Teresa says, Whoever has humility and detachment can easily go out and fight with all hell together and against the whole world and all its occasions of sin. That's what detachment can do for us. And that's what it did for St. John of the Cross. Then we can consider the case of the possessed Augustinian nun in Salamanca. She had everyone convinced 
that she was an oracle of God. Even the faculty at the University of Salamanca, where the seminary was as well. St. John heard her confession, asked her some questions, and told the men outside, told the men of the university, you're wrong. She is possessed. That is not an easy thing to do, to stand alone against all these older men and tell them they had been misled. Detachment. Perhaps nothing shows his detachment better than his imprisonment by the Calst friars. He was part of the discalced Carmelite friars, the restoration. The Calst friars were the mitigated friars. So one group was trying to restore, the other was mitigating. Sounds familiar. These cows friars captured St. John of the Cross and imprisoned him and used every means imaginable to break him down. Physical beatings nearly every day. Starvation. He suffered from malnutrition to the point of where he was getting sick and possibly would die. He lived in a dark and narrow cell with a tiny light. They would not allow him to offer the Holy Mass. They gave him an old worn out breviary and no other books. And worst of all, they used psychological torture upon him. Intimating that he would only be leaving in a box, that he was all that was left. There were no more discalced left fighting. They'd all given in. You're all that's left, John. Give up or die. This experience served him well later in his own community when he had to speak at the general chapter and write letters that ultimately led him to be sidelined and eventually ordered into the exile of Mexico. He didn't go to Mexico because he died before he was finally sent. Our Lord came to him and said, John, what would you have me do for you? This was his response. To suffer and to be despised for thee, my Lord. His wish was granted. He died in one of the most hostile convents of the Discalced Carmelite Friars, the one that liked him least. No wonder St. John is the doctor of detachment and a great saint. From his writings, his desires for more suffering, and his various experiences, it almost seems like he was constantly scouting the frontiers of the spiritual life to make sure that he was detached from all things save God and God alone. The fruits, we know them well. He was heroically patient and gentle with all those that God sent him or placed under his care. He wrote with utter clarity and sureness in all his writings. He provided the church a great service. And where he found no love, he was able to put love, God's love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.